All right, very good. All right, so we're going to start the discussion here with the basic question about can a method of manufacturing and its structure impact the shop floor business culture? Um, I'm going to use a case study to kind of make my point. Um, this information here um, probably could even uh, talk about the um, what we had done with the company was they had, they had asked us to provide some manufacturing part set of best practices and give them some ideas of, of the do's and the don'ts and some general recommendations. And it got kind of wordy over time. So after a while and a number of revisions, I had other customers who started asking for that as well. So we put together a white paper and I'll send you a link to the white paper if you're interested in something to cure insomnia. Uh, I swear it put me to sleep a couple times when I was writing it. So you should do the same for you if you have that issue. Um, but the basic idea then was, what are some best practices to try to structure your mom so that they, build, they blend in with the business well? And that became kind of the output here. And so with the company that we were specifically working with, there, the question of, of kind of imminence there was shop floor accountability. Um, the company themselves, they had engaged an outside process consultant, kind of a third party manufacturing, uh, you know, best practice, world-class manufacturing sort of an organization uh, to try to help their, their company take that big leap forward. They were a company that was scaling up and they were going from being a big little company to a little big company, as, as one of their fellows had, had stated it. I always liked that, that depiction. So they were scaling up to the degree where they had to um, really step up and handle this increased workload, increased complexity, increased sales revenues without um, all of their systems kind of breaking down because of their inability to scale. So they had brought this consultancy in to help them with that. Um, as a part of that, they reviewed all the internal processes and procedures of the, con of the, the customer. And the consultancy found this basic problem with accountability on the shop floor to be kind of a pervading and fundamental issue that they needed to overcome. And it was this basic idea that in each department, there was a, a sense of vagueness as to what they had to do, when they had to do it by, and what the expectations were. And the question that came up naturally was, well, you have this ERP system that should be able to provide some of that information. And why isn't it? So as we kind of got pulled in at that point to kind of help merge the, the, the over business process aspect with the system aspect and try to see where those came together. And we started reviewing the mom structures and we found a couple of specific things that were kind of pejoratively affecting that whole situation. Um, in one case, they had operations that did not represent the actual activities that they were doing. They had, in some cases, some very generic operations that were just kind of assemble. And assemble could mean one thing in one department. It could mean something else in another department. And it could be uh, many different assemble activities on a single component, a single finished good, but they weren't spelled out well. Um, this was especially prevalent with feeder work centers. They have... Um, component areas that are making your sub-assemblies or your manufactured components, sometimes like the fab area or special assembly, what have you. And those products are feeding into main assembly, the final assembly. And those feeder activities weren't clearly depicted in the system. They had departments, but they weren't making anything. Um, and some of that then ultimately came to the extensive use of phantom bombs in their organization. Phantom bombs had been used as kind of the, the um, panacea, the, the thing that cures all ills. But unfortunately, it kind of created some problems of its own that the phantom bombs were obscuring the actual components that were getting constructed during that process. So out of all of those mom structure issues kind of led to the insufficient manufacturing data in the ERP system to support uh, what you'd call a world-class manufacturing operation. So let me give you a, a quick layout of what their shop floor looked like. This is a kind of a simplified version. Um, on the one side you had receiving, on the other side you had shipping, which is always kind of ideal, but quite often not what we get to do in life. Um, but you have a number of feeder work centers that were fed from either the raw material storage area or the stock room. Those feeder work centers were feeding a number of final assembly lines and those finished products were going into shipping. This was an air, a company that had kind of a, a 
you might call it capital equipment. So they were making large, large machines in, in a largely customized, configured to order, engineer to order mode. Um, and within that, there were a couple of, of things that were worth noting that uh, their manufactured component materials, as I had mentioned earlier, were all phantoms. And those phantoms, when they exploded, they would clutter those final finished good job bombs with a whole bunch of operations, right? So each of those parts, those phantom parts had their own routings, but those routings jumped up a level and dropped into the final finished good routing, creating these monstrous uh, routings where a, a part that truly that finished good had one or two final operations, but these job bombs, because of all these phantoms, you'd have hundreds of operations jumping up into that final, final method, creating a lot of confusion. And uh, since the components exploded, the feeder work centers had nothing to tell them what to make. They would have you know, one operation or two operations out of this 300 operation routing, but it was always just against that finished good when truly they were making one of those key components that went into that final assembly. And as you might imagine, the scheduling and the priority management was entirely offline because the existing methods of manufacturing didn't provide any kind of key uh, a directional uh, organization for them. And this all led to a, an absence of accountability. And so what we had said kind of earlier, when they were a small shop and things were very easy, it was very easy to, I kind of use in manufacturing what you sometimes call the hauler distance, right? Uh, how complex your, your setup needs to be is relative to how far you can haul it with someone hearing you. And you had a, a small shop where people could just kind of holler to the feeder work center and say, I need these parts, I need those parts. And the, the, the volume is low and the complexity is manageable and the natural interaction between departments is, is straightforward. That became great. That was, it wasn't, wasn't hard. Um, but as some of those feeder centers got bigger and more volume came through, and even as they started to move the, some of the feeder work centers to other buildings on the campus, that hauler distance became impossible to manage. So that was kind of the, the, the context of that one situation. And that gives kind of a, a, a the thematic organizational factor here for, for some of our other discussions. And that all takes us to low handling of, of these lower level components in Epicor. Now, I always call them components because the term subassembly can mean a lot of thing to a lot of people and it means one very specific thing in Epicor. So it seems like in an implementation, the, a week gets spent agreeing on terminology. So I'll use that as kind of my shorthand for now. Um, but when we talk about manufactured components, and there's some unique challenges that these pose. And I'm, I think the rest of our discussion will be trying to address some of these. Uh, one is, is visibility. And so the general goal when you're talking about invisibility is how can you make your product needs and the need to supply certain demand visible across the organization, all right, in order to satisfy that customer's demand by also trying to be efficient while doing it. And that efficiency now drives down to what you're doing in terms of transaction. Uh, quite often within a department, uh, they might be worried about what's shipping out the door, but they also might be worried about how efficiently they're completing their products, right? How many setups do I have to do? Can I bulk setups? Can I batch parts so that I don't have to be coming in and out routinely? Even in a lean environment, I see folks challenging or running into those same challenges. And then economies of scale. Similarly with how can I not only limit my system transactions and how many times I have to transact in the system, but how many times can I optimize what I have in front of me in order to uh, make these run quantities the right size in order to hold our ship dates, but also keep our internal costs down. So I, I would say that these are kind of some of the considerations that I've seen. And there's obviously a lot of different um, variables that drive whether or not one of these is more important than the other. I've noted a couple of here in terms of you know, your product mix, your production costs, uh, the scale of your environment. If you're working with small equipment. When I was working in manufacturing, uh, a lot of the stuff that I did was all very small drill presses, small punch presses, you know, basic manufacturing stuff that changed out and in very quickly. And that would be very different than say our other machining department that had large CNC style milling, milling presses and such that were doing much more complex activity where the setup and the program, including the programming 
of, of the CMC runs was much more intensive. So those dynamics always kind of change within a company. Now, so in Epicor, we talked about kind of our general ideas. Now, you know, what, what happens with us with customers often is they come to us and they say, okay, well, now that, now that you know where we're at as a company, can we talk through how we actually are gonna handle these different components inside of Epicor? And inside of Epicor, there are a number of pretty distinct ways that you can handle the processing of manufactured components. And I'll start off with the, the probably the most basic. Um, this would be a subassembly. So in a subassembly, using the Epicor definition, right? This the mom of the manufactured component resides within the job or the work order of the parent part. So when you make one of those parent parts, you're going to make X number of these subassemblies as part of that same job. So you, I see this a lot in capital equipment manufacturers where they'll have uh, one big item and they'll have a bunch of subassemblies quite often because they're in a configure to order environment where those subassemblies are highly tailored to that situation. They might actually be even parts on the fly. It kind of varies there, but there's a definite very tight link between those component materials, those subassemblies, and the parent that they're feeding. They may make those subassemblies just once for this job and may not make it for the next number of months or even years. Another option in handling uh, these parts is what's called a make direct material. And so a make direct material is a material on the job. So instead of being a subassembly, it's a material because we know in a, in, a, in a job, the mom of a job can have subassemblies, but it also has materials and those can exist at different levels. And a make direct material is a situation where a separate job is created to supply those material requirements for the parent. So instead of a subassembly that's part of that parent work order, part of that parent job, the separate job is kicked off and created and managed uh, quasi independently. It still has a link back to that, that job, that source of demand, but it's made independently. And those costs are on that indi individual job. Um, kind of your classic uh, means of doing this in you know, ERP as it evolved out of the older MRP systems is a stock material where a manufactured component is made and put into stock and then it's issued out from stock when you need it. And really to that parent job, that parent job could care less if those parts are manufactured or they're purchased. They're all coming from stock in that same manner. How they got there might be very different, but how those parts come by the time that the job itself needs to consume those, it's really it's just a material is a material. And I say this is probably our most, uh, maybe, maybe not the most common, but at least historically has been the most common way in which components are satisfied. Now, one other uh, means, and this is kind of a, a little bit different because a phantom assembly doesn't exist on a job so much as you see the output of a phantom, what we call a phantom explosion. Um, so in a phantom case, the mom of that manufactured component, that phantom part, its materials and its operations, they, when the, when the what we call the part explodes, those parts and materials, they jump up to the next level of that higher level assembly and they take residence in there. So you don't actually have that original part anymore. You just have its components. Now in, in working with other customers, I've started to discover that, that some other systems, I think Great Plains is one of them, that uh, they have phantom assemblies that maintain that structure, even though the operations, the same explosion happens, but they still tell you what that, that parent is. So I've seen customers struggle with Epicor's interpretation of the phantom. You know, phantom is really an, an industry standard. It's not an Epicor specific thing, but even then those terms get utilized, I've found in, in some different ways across applications. So I would say these are our, our kind of our core options in terms of what we could get at the final job level, right? Because, um, and I will talk through this, a, a part goes through a number of different phases, right? You define that, that part structure in the engineer, in the engineering workbench, and it has those part operations, part materials, and you set all your settings. You're pulling in those part master records that have their own settings that affect this. But ultimately, the question that you're answering is, how should this thing look on the job? And because of things like sub-assemblies and phantoms, 
we'll find that our, our, our final job mom might look a fair bit different than a part mom. And because of that, we kind of have to have a good idea of how those transitions and transformations occur within Epicor according to what rules uh, Epicor uses. All right, so I apologize for my color palette here. The first time I did this Visio doc, it was, it was right around Easter. So everything came out as kind of an Easter egg pastel shade. Um, and I, and I, I kind of grew fond of it. So I've taken my pastels with me everywhere I go. Um, so it's really important to understand the default behavior of a part master when it goes from a part through the engineering workbench and to the, to the job mom. And I'll call this default behavior. So part master, first thing we want to talk about is the, the, the infamous non-stock flag. And uh, my English teacher always told me in grade school never to use a double negative. But in Epicor ease, I find we're always calling stuff not non-stock, which seems, you know, whenever we try to explain not non-stock to a first-time Epicor customer, we get that sort of querulous uh, head nodding. That, that takes, uh, it's kind of a, a, a strange Kool-Aid that takes a while to, to get used to. Um, I, I wish I could know the Epicor engineer who decided, who made that fateful decision X number of years ago to call this non-stock versus just, I don't know, stock. Anyways, we, we could spend a lot of time debating that one, but the biggest piece here um, has to do with that non-stock flag at the part master level. So parts can be stock or they can be non-stock. So if a part is non-stock, that means that you are gonna satisfy it directly, whether you're at a sales order on the sales order release, if you're gonna make that thing or you're gonna buy it to order, all right? If it's a, on a purchase order, if you're gonna buy it directly either to a sales order or buy it directly to a job material, or if it's a material on a job, are you going to make that thing directly? Are you Are going to treat it as a sub-assembly? All of that is affected by that non-stock flag. Now, stocked is really simple. It's stocked is, okay, I'm going to buy this part or I'm going to make this part. I'm going to put it into inventory and I'm going to extract it as needed. Now, how you buy that part or how you make that part, if you're going to make it with minimums, are you going to have, you know, a lot multiples that you want to make it because uh, when I was working in the factory, I used to run a saw and we cut X number of parts out of a bar and our bars were fixed lengths. So you always knew that when you cut up this bar, you get 20 pieces out of it. So you came up with a lot multiples of 20 so that every time you were consuming an entire bar. Um, there are some variabilities there. I think a lot of customers really get a lot of benefit out of uh, what we call days of supply using that little functionality to group sections of days together so that I can get some uh, optimization and you know, some economies of scale and transactional reduction while at the same time not completely bogging down my company according to a fixed rigid kind of minimum order quantity or minimum on hand inventory. So there's some, some value there, but that all comes from that non-stock versus stocked uh, delineation. Now, when this pushes to the engineering workbench, now that, that has an, a natural effect. So if something is flagged as non-stock, your pull as assembly flag on the engineering workbench is going to default to true. When you add a material to a method, it's automatically going to want to check that thing as true. And because of that, when it gets to a job, it's going to want to treat that job as a sub-assembly. All right, so a default behavior, a non-stock part, will come into the engineering workbench as a pull as assembly material, and that ultimately will become a sub-assembly when that thing gets to be a job and you get details for that parent part. Now a stock part, conversely, it'll come into that engineering workbench as pull as assembly being false, and then when it comes down to the job, it'll again just be that issued from stock material, just a regular old job material. And let me talk about, now I'm gonna stop killing you by PowerPoint here for a little while at least, and, and open up the, the actual Epicor application because that that is what this is all about after all. Um, but I wanna talk to you a couple of, of little examples. I've done some, some basic setup just to kind of give you some ideas of way. This is in practice um, how some of this works. And I apologize if this is 
um, if I'm just preaching to the choir and this is information you've covered already, when I give this, this presentation for customers and at some of the other EUGs, I get kind of a mix of, oh yeah, that's obvious and oh wow, we never did that before. I think with, with customers who step into an existing implementation and the, the, the folks who had originally implemented have since left the company, trying to figure out some of this black magic sometimes is where some of the challenges are. Um, so I have a couple examples here and I'll just talk through them for you. Uh, I started off with this part, BSS 1010. This was straight out of the training database. Uh, it's a stocked manufactured part, i.e. it's not non-stock. I took that part and I copied it and I made a version of it that was manufactured like the original, but it's flagged as non-stock. So I'm gonna use this in our make direct and our sub-assembly examples. And then I had one another part, uh, DSS 1010 NSPB. Again, it's a manufactured and it's non-stock, but it's also a phantom. So this is our phantom version of the, the same part. So I took the same basic component materials and gave us kind of three different examples. Now, similarly, I took that part and this part will show up as material sequence 10 in all of our examples. And I took that part and I created some parent assemblies. I created one for uh, DSS 1000. That's again, straight out of the training database. And it is where material sequence 10, this DSS 1010 is a stock material. So this is our, what you might call our vanilla example, our basic uh, make, make to stock model. Now, DSS 1000 MDN has, as you might expect, a make direct material. So that part, DSS 1010 NS, that non-stock material, is going to produce a make direct uh, material and DSS 1000 sub is unlike that going to produce a job sub assembly. So we'll walk through the setup and how we get from that part and part mom set up to a job sub assembly. And then finally, we'll talk about a phantom assembly where I took that same material part NSPB and I added it to material sequence 10 as a pull as assembly phantom assembly. We will go through that. So let me get out of my PowerPoint here for one second. And let us jump into, all right, so I have for our purposes here, I will start with our component materials as we've noted. So the first component 1010 is a non-stock item, all right, it has, oh, I try to, let's do this very quickly. If you ever get pulling tabs for a reason, then you have to undo it. Here's my free tutorial, reset layouts to base. Probably the first thing I learned as an Epicor customer was reset layouts to base because I started panicking as soon as I Closed up my tab orders. Um, okay, so let's take this part and let's quickly look at it in the method tracker. Um, and it has X number, it has seven operations and a handful of materials. Okay, our friend here, non-stock, has the same mom. The only difference is it is flagged as non-stock. Now I really should say too is we all know that even though it's flagged up on the main part, the thing that Epicor is looking at is on the plant ID, all right? So very important that, especially if you're working in DMT land, and I would say that it seems like at least a quarter of the issues I run into in manufacturing, when we run into something where the system's not behaving like it should, it's some issue on the plant tab because the plant tab, for some reason, got out of sync with the main tab. And people, myself included, tend to think of that main tab as the home, but really when Epicor is processing, it's going back to that site. Now this is a good thing, of course, you know, in multi-site environments, you might treat parts very differently. If a part is like a transfer part that gets moved from one organization, you know, one site to another, you might have that whole difference, um, but I digress. So this is my non-stock version. All right, and then I have my phantom bomb version. All right, so it's not only non-stock, it is a phantom. And I'm not gonna go to the revision, just uh, trust me to say that it is a duplicate of that original DSS 1010. And now, kind of more importantly, as we get into 
the main parts. So I have this parent assembly, All right? We come and we look at this parent assembly and we jump into its method. And so the key to our discussion here is our friend material sequence 10. So here I have this part number DSS 1010 set. It is not pull as assembly. And we'll remember that this part was a stocked part, a not non-stocked part. We will then move down the road to our make direct material. And we come here and now we look to our make direct material. And it has that 1010, DSS 1010 NS, all right? So it's pulled in as a non pull as assembly. So remember we talked about this part is a non-stock part and yet it's not flagged pull as assembly. That's because when I engineered this thing, I unchecked that manually. And you can see here uh, due to its uh, mom icon that it's showing up not as a sub assembly, but just as a material. Then we get to its conversant here, uh, DSS 1000 sub. And here, material sequence 10, you can see the icon has changed now to that uh, sub-assembly icon. And that is because this non-stock part, I retained that pull as assembly flag that we had seen before in our Easter diagram. And finally, our phantom bomb version has the same part, except it has our phantom version. All right. And that phantom version is flagged as pull as assembly. All right, so now, now that we know all these settings and we flipped all these flags, just what happens now when we actually create some jobs? That's what we're going to work to answer next. All right, so let me start off with the job I created. I just used quick job entry to bang out some make to stock jobs. All right, so we have at the top level, we have a two operation routing. And we have a number of materials here. And we have material sequence 10 is coming in as a stocked material. And you know that a material is a stocked material because the make direct is not checked, nor is the purchase direct checked. So if you know that something is being supplied directly and not from stock, one of those direct flags needs to be checked. Now in our case, we're gonna be looking at make direct because these, this is a manufacturing example. All right, so this is kind of our vanilla example. Material comes in, makes the stock, all is well. Let us digress now and go to 2434. Now we're looking at our, our make direct material part that it has. All right, you can see here we have our color scheme has changed. We got kind of a little amber light on there now. And when we come and we look here, we see that this part DSS 1010 NS is flagged as make direct. Okay, that's a, a big deal because let's go ahead and open this with our friend time phase. All right, and I took the liberty of running MRP uh, so that we could see what happens to that uh, job here. And you can see that here is our demand from the job, 2434 is demanding 10 components. The, it was a one-to-one -one quantity per, and the parent job was making 10 of these to stock. And this uh, job component now, this component material, has a firm job created by MRP to go and create that. So I'm gonna quickly jump into that and open another option of job entry. If this isn't something familiar to, hold the shift button down if you want to open two of the same forms. Lenny Marks taught me that back in the early 2000s, and I've loved them ever since. Um, so if we come here now, we have this part here. We're making this non-stock part. We're making 10 of them. And we look at our demand link. We are making them now to the job. See, we see we're making this to the parent job 2434, supplying material sequence 10 which is, if we go back to our job, we'll remember it's 2434 material sequence 10, this make direct job now has a little job uh, supplying it. Okay, so this is kind of that whole idea that supplying a job 
without stocking levels, without going through inventory through man or through uh, the warehouse to get that part back out and such. This is one way of doing that. And we'll talk about the pluses and minuses here if I can keep myself moving. All right, so now we're talking about uh, 2435, which is for DS1000 sub. All right, and we come down, we try to find material sequence 10, and oh, sure enough, material sequence 10 is not there. And the reason that it is, is that that part, DSS 1010NS, jumped up as a subassembly now. So now this part, with all of its operations and all of its materials, now resides in that same job. So this job, we're making two parts. We're making a subassembly that will feed into the final assembly, even though this 1010NS part is the exact same part that we were supplying in our previous example with a make direct job. And our one last example is our friend, the Phantom. All right, so no subassemblies up in this example. Again, we're missing our material sequence 10. All right, but you'll notice we have a lot more materials on this job and many more operations. Remember, some of our original jobs had two operations. Now we have all of these component operations that came from that phantom material now jumped up into this parent top level. And now they're all going to be processed at, at the top level as opposed to in a separate job or as a subassembly. All right, so those are our basic examples here. And I wanna go through one little example here right away and see one little piece that's kind of an interesting uh, kind of use case here. Let me go back to 34, all right? So 2434, you'll remember, is the job that had the subassembly. Now let's say scheduling comes in and we discover, okay, we've already firmed this job up, so MRP is not managing anymore, but demand patterns change. We have to delete this job and uh, hold off. Now we go, okay, so we tell our scheduler, our scheduler comes to delete this job. And now we get, ta-da, we get this extra little bit of information. Oh, okay, job has demand links to a firm job to this other MRP job, we can't go ahead and delete this job. Now we have to go and find all the children. And this will come up in some of my later slides here. One of the key, key considerations is how you want, you want to manage changes. Do you live in a very nervous environment where you find yourself having to make significant changes to firm jobs uh, after they've gone through the MRP creation process? If so, well, maybe this make direct flag might be kind of problematic. I had one customer who had basically all their component materials were done in a make direct mode. And it worked very well for them because it very clearly tied supply and demand, but managing changes and they happen to be in a, in a configurator heavy environment where a lot of their materials were, you know, features and options changed a lot, created a lot of problems in, in that one front. All right, so let me quickly go back to my presentation here. See that I'm managing to fill the hours. All right, so let's go over our default behavior here briefly. So this is uh, stocked material from the part master to the job. So this part, it's a stocked part. It comes down and it's not flagged as pull as assembly when we engineer it. At, when we engineer it or add it to its parent on the engineering workbench. And then when it comes time for that material to come, it comes in as a non make direct material, as a stocked material. Now our non stocked part, and when we go from pat part master to job, we have this part here, this NS part that's non stock. We add it as a material. It by default flags to be pull as assembly. And then when we create our job for the parent item, we get ourselves assembly. We don't have that material sequence. That material sequence went away. So this is one of the override scenarios that we wanna talk about. And we've seen this already in example. This is the make direct, right? So when you process a, a non-stock part as a job material, we go through that same flow. A part master is true, a non-stock is true. But in the engineering workbench, we uncheck pull as assembly because we don't want to treat this as assembly, as subassembly. 
the key at the job mom is you end up with a make direct material. And here this gets a little more complicated. I had one customer say that I must be billing them by the red line. Um, in this case, we have this part um, 1010NS. It comes in as a material. We uncheck the pull as assembly flag but it's still non-stock. So Epicor looks at both places when getting details for that parent level item. And it says, okay, well, you're, you're non-stock, but you're not an assembly. That means I must treat you as a make direct material. And now when it comes time to generate MRP demand, I'm gonna generate MRP demand with a make to job demand link to supply. And our phantom, this is kind of a comparison diagram here. So we have a part that is a phantom. It comes in as pull as assembly. And this is interesting. When we went to version 10, up to 10, when you added a phantom as a material, it just came on as a material. And at some point in version 10, it started to explode right in your face when you added it. Uh, sent all of us consultants for a little bit of a, a little bit of a head check there, because that was kind of new and unexpected. But anyways, so this part is non-stock and it's a phantom bomb. Right, so it comes into the method of manufacturing and this phantom has its own routing and its own bill of materials. And when you get details for that parent level job, what you see, these operations jumped up into the finished good, the zero level assemblies routing, and these materials jumped up in the uh, bill of material for that finished good while the part itself disappeared. That is your classic phantom explosion. All right, so comparing those two jobs, non-stock versus phantom, we see we have a two operation scenario versus a, a nine operation and your materials you can see are similarly uh, multiplied. So some general considerations here as we wind down. A um, Couple of things to be considering. I gave you some considerations at the beginning. There's some sort of kind of elaborations on that. And one has to do with on-hand inventory. So, is your intent with these components to hold parts and in inventory in advance of actual demand? Do you have like uh, raw material lead times or economies of scale or other considerations like that? If that drives you to hold those things on, on inventory, you don't wanna react when actual demand comes, then you might wanna look at these parts as stocked materials. Um, specificity and uniqueness. So, how unique is this thing in question? Is it a, a repeatable product or is this a one-off thing that you're not gonna make very often? And I would say the general rule is the more unique the thing is, you treat it as a non-stock. Now there are environments where things get so unique that they become parts on the fly, which is its own kind of three beer conversation. So I'll spare you that. Uh, one other consideration I, can, I like to think of is aggregation. And the question here is, is it your intent to aggregate supply of a given part across jobs? So if you're gonna do something non-stock, uh, what you need to understand is non-stock operations, whether you're talking at a sales order or at a job material is kind of tunnel vision. It does not seek to aggregate supply without you manually intervening. Um, there's some really cool things you could do to intervene and aggregate supply like using the job manager to add uh, combined demand links on one job or using the job batching process to batch a bunch of smaller jobs into one job, which does a similar uh, job demand link movement. Um, but that takes some extra steps. If you like the idea of being able to run 200 of a part because you have a total demand of 200 across a time period, oh, that's great. That's where I was mentioning things like days of supply and such uh, can help you. So stocked material, if you have stuff that's flagged as stocked, MRP is going to do that aggregation for you. And that means you'll have fewer jobs to supply components. And that can help you if you, if you like those kind of big batch worlds. And I, every company is a little different in that area. So if aggregation is a big value to you, then you might want to stock these parts. Now, visibility is probably the other side of aggregation. The great thing about um, about visibility, about you know, make direct or sub assemblies, what have you. Uh, there's a great visibility when you process them to what am I supplying, right? The demand links aren't now just to a generic warehouse, they are to uh, a specific product, a specific order. 
or job. And that's very helpful for a lot of companies. They like to have that visibility. Um, I'd say you can probably do some similar things if you're running like the pegging process or what have you to do some of that same thing in a stocked environment. So again, there's always some, some other alternatives that you can do, but if visibility is, is your fundamental key there, one of those things is non-stock. And one thing I, I, I wanted to note is, now when you say the non-stock stock question, a lot of customers immediately think that if I, if I flag it as stock, oh, now it means I have to hold inventory and I don't want this ERP project to puff up our inventory levels. But it's really important to understand that you can define a part as stock without having to store any minimum inventory. And I see a lot of customers do that, where they react to actual demand, but they like some of those things that I've mentioned already with regard to aggregation and, and what have you, that they like to process a part of stock, even though they're not gonna have a minimum inventory level. So that's, that's not something that you have to sign yourself up for if you're gonna stock a part. All right, so general considerations here. See, I'm running a little low on time, so I'll try to talk faster. Uh, make direct versus subassembly, right? So if you're, when you're in non-stock, now what do I wanna do if I wanna make direct or if I wanna process it as a subassembly? You know, the Equicore mechanics, all right, couple of basics. If it's flagged as a phantom, it needs to be flagged, pull as assembly, or else it'll blow up in your face when you're engineering the thing. That might not be a problem to you, for some folks it is they like to have that engineering consistency. They want that indented build material to mirror the physical models that they've developed in their CAD system. Um, if the part's non-stock and the intent is to supply it through jobs, then you need to uncheck that pull as assembly flag. Now, if the part is non-stock, but you want to use it as a sub-assembly, you can leave that pull as assembly flag defaulted it as it comes. Now, there's one other additional consideration, and this has to do with configurability. Now in my spare time, I'm a configurator consultant. And one of the challenges here is you cannot configure make direct materials without a whole bunch of custom code to create a, a make direct part. So if you're going down the, the, the non-stock route on a, on a component part, then you're doing a component configured part on the fly, you're gonna be going down the sub-assembly route. All right, the configure doesn't support the configuring of a make direct material. Um, so that if you're in a configured environment, you might find yourself, your, your options already a little limited. Uh, one consideration here then has to do with that manufacturing environment. Now, if you're in a project manufacturing environment, that's kind of really job traveler driven. What I've seen in general is that the subassembly route works better for those companies. You know, you, you can kind of um, define a, a manufacturing operation by, well, do you use the priority dispatch or do you use the job traveler as your key uh, document to guide you? And that sort of can tell you right away where you're going. If you're more of a, a work queue or a priority dispatch draw, uh, driven environment, you might like that make direct process a little bit better because now you're just worried about operation by operation and not worried about that overarching job so much. All right, and as I had noted before, make direct demand links can add some steps when you're modifying jobs. So that's always a consideration to make on the transactional level, as I had mentioned, mentioned earlier. So some general considerations on the phantom bomb. So I always like this little mushroom cloud because I always think of the bomb, you know, bombs explode, phantoms explode, phantom bomb. It seems just, you know, like all the, all the planets aligned for that one. Um, so if a part is stocked, it should not, it cannot be flagged phantom bomb. Part must first be non-stocked before you can flag it as a phantom. Now, you can get yourself into some DMT trouble there where those don't agree. And, uh, and I, I would um, urge caution there with a number of companies, uh, the downstream, you can have stuff blow up on you for un under uncomprehensible reasons um, if you don't have that carefully related when you're playing with DMT. Um, but in terms of the relationship of the parent assembly to a component, I like to think about phantoms. And a lot of customers ask us now, what are the, when should I have something a phantom? All right, because I told you right, right at that beginning uh, scenario, that case study, phantoms were creating all these problems. Now, I kind of use three dimensions. One is independence. So if parts made independently of its parent, okay, different place, different time, if you have it in another building, you're making it in a different campus, you shouldn't flag this thing as a phantom bomb. You should treat this thing as either a material or a sub-assembly so that you can manage and be accountable for producing that component part. 
um, uh, kind of the converse is dependent. Is this part something that's made right at the same time as the parent? Because sometimes you'll have things that engineering has defined as a sub-assembly. It'll have components and pieces and all those things, but truly you only assemble this thing when you're screwing it onto the parent assembly. And I'll have an example here in the next slide. Those might be good cases to be a phantom bomb. And then kind of considering the above, I, I hear from the engineers a lot, there's a desire to have kind of phantom assemblies in the bomb structure um, so that you have good continuity between the engineering model and all of its levels and the parts itself and their levels that makes them more maintainable from an engineering standpoint. So I've seen engineers make that case and I see some logic there to try to keep those things consistent so that they're easier to maintain from a, from a CAD model level. And given that Star Wars movies have, have concluded, I would say one of my, my final recommendations here is don't let your phantom assemblies become a phantom menace. Uh, probably one of the worst of the Star Wars movies, but we won't go there. And, and ultimately, don't let the phantom bombs blow up in your face because to our case study, they sure can. And I'm sorry, I'm just gonna hog this session here. My mouth just has a certain amount of air that it needs to consume before I'm done. So in handling uh, components, I got an example. I worked with a conveyor company and they have these very complex, flexible conveying uh, machines that we helped configure and, and process in Epicor. And they have a couple of really good examples of, of components on these things that they processed in different ways. So the first was a panel box. So the panel box, it was made in its own little panel box department. Um, these things were sometimes standard, sometimes configured. All right, so what we chose there was we were always gonna treat these things as pull as assembly, sub assemblies. So they always came in, they would be related to a job. There was a lot of specificity there, so that kind of seemed logical. And they would go off and make theirs and then they would transfer them across departments so they could be cons consumed at final electrical assembly. These were electrical conveyors. Um, Another component they had were legs. Now legs, they had kind of two combinations. They had these high volume parts that they had a lot of them for some very popular models. And then they had a lot of low volume parts and they tried, they decided to divide those up into high volume. They treated them as stock parts. They made them ahead of time, low volume. They only made them as needed and they kept them as uh, non-stock so that they always need, knew where those things needed to go because that relationship helped them route it physically through the, through the factory. And they had one other component, which was kind of like a panel, but much simpler, just a plain old button box. So it had some electrical components, it had a little sheet metal shell to it, but this thing was only manufactured when they literally would screw this to the parent conveyor. So it made perfect sense here to treat this button box as a phantom because there was no value in making it separately because it really was part of that electrical assembly option. So coming back to our original question, can uh, a mom structure impact a shop floor business culture? And my, my answer here obviously in my case would be yes, is that you know, a mom structure can give you guidance on what needs to be made and when. And guidance drives accountability. Um, this guidance is especially good when you're in a feeder workshop to say that these guys need to be feeding you so that you can do what you can do because you can only be held accountable if all the materials and components are available for you to be successful. So it becomes really important that you're also allowing your feeder lines to be successful. Um, recommendation out of this quite often then is when you lay out those moms, have a real good look at your factory floor, kind of like I did at the beginning there and see what's that physical layout look like? What parts are processing through what areas and try to understand how that might relate to your mom. And when you get onto the shop, well work to try to get your MES and your, your labor entry, your time entry, try to come up with methodologies that you're reporting time sufficiently that you can control that kind of accountability. If you back flush everything all the way down, well, you might have some hard times there being accountable because back flushing kind of takes that away in favor of efficiency. And that's a balancing act that you need to have. And then on the reporting end, you know, there are all kinds of things. Once you have those other settings set up that you can start measuring using some metrics and start predicting, you know, even getting more, you know, per mark session, getting more predictive and analytic with how you treat the information that's flowing through your, through your shop. So that's it for me. Uh, Estes Group, we are your managed IT and Epicor partner. And I couldn't help but get that one in. But anyways, 
thank you very much for your time. And uh, if you have any questions here, I would be more than interested to give a, a little bit of time here. There are some questions. One came in, um, is job costing affected by these various methods of setting up moms? Okay, um, yes and no. Uh, there's a great little flag at um, the company configurator called, um, uh, what is it called? Enable manufacturing cost elements. Okay, and that really will define whether or not when you issue a, say, a job uh, from a make direct. So that make direct, you complete that and you process a job issue to job transaction. If that enable cost elements is flagged, that those cost components will come over as they did in that existing. So labor cost will come over to labor and burden will come over to burden. Now, if you don't flag that, all those uh, costs will come over just as, I believe, just as plain old material costs. So that is kind of actually, I think, the bigger factor in driving your costing. I would say, in general, the, the cost of these items, if you're, especially if you're rolling them according to the moms, uh, should be the same. All right, and uh, one more. Do the tools you use in Epicor for planning and scheduling vary according to the setup of the parts? Oh, okay, sure, sure. So yeah, there's some, some interesting things there. And I've seen, again, companies use different tools to accomplish the same thing. So you got MRP can process a lot of your work and produce your jobs for you and get those in front of you. Some companies don't like to do that. Um, some do. Uh, we're working with a company right now where they could be doing creating jobs through MRP, but they'd rather have it go through the planning workbench and process everything through the planning workbench and let that be their kind of milestone for checking everything and doing all the things you need to do from a scheduling standpoint, maybe putting one together paperwork or setting up tooling or what have you. Um, in a more stocked environment, I see folks doing straight MRP processing and then using, say, job status maintenance as their key tool for handing off from supply to demand and getting stuff in front of the shop floor. Um, the job manager, of course, is a tool that can be used in certain environments. So if you're more of a standard product, but a lot of make direct, you might find yourself wanting to use the job manager or the resource scheduling workbench to batch jobs and process some of that to try to gain some of those efficiencies. And then if you're in a configured environment, now this was another thing that, that at one point, MRP did not do very well with configured product. It does much better now. Uh, so more and more customers aren't using what we what we call the or, uh, order job wizard, which allows a salesperson to generate jobs directly from a sales order, which is especially helpful specifically in make to order situations, which configured would be one of them. Um, so I would say yes, in general, you know, as you make those decisions, you, you want to be talking, having these conversations. You know, I say a mom conversation is never a conversation with one team. It's you have manufacturing, you have scheduling, you have engineering, you even have sales involved probably to try to understand, okay, how do we want to concoct these things so that we can, can be optimal internally and externally? All right. And um, last question, how does plan as assembly, uh, assembly, <laughs> I need another cup of coffee. How does plan as assembly affect scheduling? Oh boy, plan as assembly. There's a three beer conversation and I'm stone sober. Um, so plan as assembly is kind of a blend between the stock model and the pull as assembly model where pull as assembly will treat everything as a sub assembly. Plan as assembly will look at your on hand inventory and your, your available inventory and will write calculate your number of sub-assemblies you'll be making because it's assuming that you're going to plan it as assembly but you might also have materials uh, coming in and might be issuing sub-assemblies so it's kind of a i would say that boy how many of my customers have used plan as assembly i can't think of one off the cuff just because it's a little more advanced but we have seen some customers who have come back to us looking for optimizations actually mark and i worked on a customer to try to see if plan as assembly works out for them I would say that's probably something you do after all the other options are, are insufficient. You see if that might give you something for your buck. Okay. And we actually got one more. Um, so I'll give us a little break after this, um, but do want to make sure we get these uh, answered for you. If you have a long downtime between operations, how is that best handled when creating the mom for the part? 
Okay, yeah, this is Epicor's, uh, another thing where Epicor, in my mind, uh, falls a little short of some other systems is that you cannot define uh, move and queue time by part, you have to define them by resource group. Um, so if you have parts sometimes that have varying uh, cure times or some other sort of time that something needs to sit between, um, you find yourself having challenges there. I would say that if you can, you use move and queue time. You define that on the resource group um, to define how much time something. So move time is how long does it take to leave this, this operation and get to the next one? Because then Epicor on the operation will schedule a little move and queues in there. Uh, queue is how much time beforehand does it sit before I get it? That's generally the best way of doing that. If you don't have that situation because you have very part specific, I've seen customers put in uh, like back flushed uh, queue operations at zero costs some things like that. Not as clean, not a big fan of that, but I understand the reason why you might have to do that to try to give yourself a, a more accurate kind of lead time for you.